All right, well, welcome everyone to Climate Ventures Conversations. Thanks for joining us. Um, this event is a series that's hosted by the Center for Social Innovations Climate Ventures. If you're meeting us for the first time, welcome. The Center for Social Innovation is a community co-working space and launch pad for entrepreneurs, organizations, and companies that are changing the world by putting people and planet first and building the next economy. Across our three locations in Toronto, there are about 1,000 social purpose organizations that call CSI their work home, and that translates to about 3,000 people. In these times, we are a vibrant online community, and we, con we continue to offer daily opportunities for our members to virtually gather, learn, and collaborate together, including community events, education programs, and acceleration programs. Climate Ventures is CSI's Climate Solutions Incubator that's located at CSI Spadina. As a home for climate within CSI, we offer space, programming, and advisory services for entrepreneurs and innovators tackling climate solutions and climate justice. And this includes the Earth Tech program, which is an accelerator for startups and nonprofits working on climate and freshwater technology. And you can learn more about us at climateventures.org. At CSI, we always start our events with an acknowledgement of the land that we're on, even when we're hosting virtual events. So today we want to acknowledge that for those of us who are in Toronto, we're gathering on the, the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nations. As we think and talk about social innovation, we are sometimes discussing a shared vision for a sustainable and just future. However, it's also critical that we reflect on the past and the present to consider how we can strive towards more inclusive, resilient communities that incorporate and respect many different ways of knowing and being. And as we move our work and our lives into, into the digital realm, this also means considering how patterns of inequality can transcend into these spaces. So on that note, we want to share this quote from Alexander Dirksen on decolonizing digital spaces. Meaningful change begins with recognition of technological innovation as a fundamentally human endeavor. Behind the sleek glass and metal enclosures of our lithium charged lifelines are people with each line of code carrying with it all the complexities of human existence. Technology is not a neutral force, nor are digital spaces safe spaces for all, instead mirroring, replicating, and at times exacerbating the real and pressing realities faced by indigenous peoples and other marginalized communities in physical spaces. The social justice lens must therefore be applied to all that we discuss, design, and develop in the digital realm. So we encourage you to consider what it might look like in your work to apply a social justice lens, whether you're also hosting emergent conversations or if you're participating in them and shaping them. And, we'll, uh, and we also recommend you check out Native Land where you can learn more about the land that you're on. So without further ado, um, I'm delighted to introduce our guest for this month, Mark Lee. Mark Lee is a senior economist with the British Columbia Office of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Mark joined the CCPA in 1998 and is one of Canada's leading progressive commentators on, on economic and social policy issues. Mark led the CCPA's Climate Justice Project which published a wide range of research on fair and effective approaches to climate action through integrating principles of social justice. Mark continues to write about climate and energy policy, as well as strategies for affordable housing. Over his career, Mark has tracked federal and provincial budgets and economic trends and published a, a wide range of topics from poverty and inequality to globalization and international trade to public services and regulation. Mark was classically trained with an MA in economics from Simon Fraser University and a BA in, in economics from the University of Western Ontario. But most of the time he argues against the conventional wisdom of economics uh, and policy debates. Mark is the past chair of the Progressive Economics Forum and contributes regularly to relentlessly progressive economics. Mark will be interviewed today by Barnaby Geis, who is our director of programs at CSI. Barnaby started Climate Ventures and has led a range of acceleration programs that support entrepreneurs, innovators, and leaders working on climate solutions. So Barnaby, I'll hand it over to you uh, to tell us about CB Conversations and get the conversation started. Thank you so much, Zoya, and welcome everyone. Uh, speaking for myself, this has been a, an anxious week, so I'm sure others are feeling anxious. So thank you for joining us. Hopefully we can provide uh, a great conversation and also a great distraction as the final results of the American election come in. 
So CV Mornings is our opportunity to sit down with climate leaders from across the country. And as we've moved online, increasingly perhaps around the world. So thank you for joining us. And thank you, Mark, for joining us. So Mark, uh, as Zoya said in your bio, uh, you were classically trained uh, in, as an economist, uh, but you tend to argue against the conventional wisdom in economics and policy debates. So this made me curious about your own journey from being classically trained to perhaps starting to question the conventional wisdom. Uh, I was wondering what drove you to study economics in the first place and when did your relationship uh, to the field change if, if you would word it that way? Hi, well, first of all, uh, thanks so much for having me here, uh, Barnaby and Zoya and, and Shay. Um, it's a real pleasure. I'm coming to you from um, East Vancouver, uh, the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil uh, peoples. Uh, but I'm actually a Toronto boy. I, I grew up uh, in Toronto and I, I moved out to the West Coast uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, for, for grad school. Uh, and thanks also for using uh, that headshot that's really out of date because you're probably looking at it, me now and thinking <laughs> he's a lot grayer and older uh, than that headshot. So um, yeah, we, it prompted me and, uh, and the staff to get a whole bunch of new updated headshots that are a bit more, more realistic and more current. Um, so uh, yeah, it's interesting. I, I feel like I've had a very uh, long and strange journey towards becoming a, a progressive economist and, and getting into climate justice. Uh, as I mentioned, I grew up in Toronto uh, in a single parent household, uh, but my mom came from a wealthy family and she really had the values of, 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 of the wealthy uh, in mind. So I got sent to Upper Canada College uh, right in the heart of, uh, of Toronto. Uh, and early on when I was a teenager, I was just interested in finding my place in the, the big uh, social order of Toronto. I wanted to make money and have wealth. And I, you know, I thought I would be a, a banker or a corporate lawyer or, or something like that, something that made a, a lot of money. Um, what changed me? Um, I think a few things. Uh, I had a series of very progressive uh, girlfriends who opened my eyes up to uh, different perspectives and uh, different ways uh, of thinking. Uh, and I think I was always very just interested in ideas. Uh, so I pursued a lot of non-mainstream ideas, uh, particularly in grad school. I was able to um, you know, break out of the kind of main neoclassical paradigm that our core courses were in. And I looked at, you know, institutional economics and um, ecological economics. I did a lot of work around sort of, you know, technology and economic growth. And also was just really interested in you know, importing ideas from sociology and psychology and, you know, other areas that were kind of on the fringe uh, of the standard way of teaching economics uh, in, in grad school. Uh, I worked for the, the federal government for three and a half years after I finished uh, grad school. So I got to live in Ottawa and got to have the experience of being uh, a civil servant, uh, largely working on what they called back then the information highway, but you know, basically the internet and digital services uh, as they've come to evolve. Um, you know, my uh, girlfriend, who later became my wife, uh, had a strong interest in international development. Uh, we were engaged through Oxfam Canada and, and put on a course um, that, on, on popular development. And so when we moved back to Vancouver, we created our own course, uh, an eight-week uh, course on globalization. Uh, and that was kind of a hot topic of the time. This was around 1998. You know, the World Trade Organization had just come into being, NAFTA, uh, negotiations on the free trade area of the Americas, all of these things were really hot topics back then. And uh, we felt that we had some insight that we could offer to folks who are interested in that. Um, and, and then CCPA came shortly after that. I, it, was, it was one of those random things. Um, uh, it was a much smaller organization uh, at the time, and I think they saw the value in having uh, a progressive economist on staff. And you know, the job posting arrived in my email inbox literally on my birthday in, in 1998. Um, and you know, I didn't seem to think that I would be able to get the job uh, then, but it was a good fit back then, and uh, and together, you know, over twenty plus years, uh, I think we've really grown together. Um, my own learnings, and also you know, contributing to to the work of of CCPA, which is now you know a much bigger uh, national organization. So uh, it's been a great ride. That's great. Thank you.
And as you've uh, hinted at, you've really written on a ton of a wide range of economic and social policy issues um, from poverty, inequality, globalization, international trade, public services and regulation. I'm wondering when did the climate kind of become a focus of yours and, and, and climate justice as well? I think it's always been simmering in the background for me. Uh, I first learned about climate change back in the late 1980s when I was in high school. Uh, it was called the greenhouse effect uh, back then. Uh, and, you know, there was a big surge of interest in environmental issues uh, back during that time. That was when Canada first started to set uh, targets uh, for greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, many have targets have been set since and, and we haven't met a single one of them. Uh, but nonetheless, there was this broad based uh, interest uh, at, at the time. Um, but I think I largely put those issues aside as I got into, you know, the technology and information communications uh, space. Uh, at CCPA, I mostly worked on provincial and federal budgets and tax policy and, you know, financing public services, uh, globalization and regulation. Um, we actually had a, um, a, a really great person working on at the intersection of uh, you know, resource industries and environmental policy in BC named uh, Dale Marshall. And he, he's currently working for environmental defense, but he did some early work we published, I think it was around 2001, called Making Kyoto Work. So uh, for those who are younger, um, the, what, what, what was the Paris Agreement used to be called the Kyoto Accord as the first global agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and, and Making Kyoto Work was uh, a project that you know, worked with the labor movement uh, and environmental groups and First Nations to think about transition strategies for the energy uh, industry. And, and you know, that, on the basis of that plan, we, you know, we got um, the Canadian Auto Workers, which is now Unifor, uh, and other major unions to support Kyoto. And then we think that actually helped with Canada's Kyoto ratification, you know, such uh, as it was. Um, flash forward to 2007 in BC, Premier uh, Gordon Campbell um, got, you know, very conservative, uh, pro-business, pro-market premier, uh, came back from his uh, annual vacation in Hawaii, full of zeal about uh, climate change and set about a whole of government exercise in how BC could, um, could reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, you know, uh, culminating in, uh, you know, Canada's first sort of broad-based uh, carbon tax. Um, we thought that there was a progressive take needed on that. Up to that point, that particular BC government had been uh, cutting public services and very punitive to people uh, on, on welfare. And we thought that um, you know, using the, the skill set that we had around tax policy and public services, and you know, we could it, sort of insert the DNA of social justice into climate policy using BC as a case study. Um, so the ecological economics that I studied back in grad school became very important to the, the perspective that uh, I took on that and then what became the, the climate justice uh, project. We applied for a, a big multi-year SHRC grant, SHRC being the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, and we won uh, and then set about producing all of this, you know, a, a lot of it was very visionary uh, literature about how um, transportation could be uh, transformed, about housing and green jobs and all of these things. Later in the project, we ended up uh, doing a lot more defense, uh, you know, arguing against new bitumen pipelines and liquefied natural gas and fracking and that kind of stuff. But I think that spirit of, uh, you know, how can we reinvent the country and think about uh, system change uh, was a really important strand in, in the work that we did. Thank you. And yeah, the BC is a, a fascinating case study. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll circle back to it. Uh, I did want to start kind of at a I guess a, a more basic question around what we mean when we talk about the economy, because you know it has this this primacy in public debate that often feels kind of divorced or abstracted from people's daily lives. Uh, I remember studying political science and learning about the economy in university. I heard a speech by David Suzuki, and I'll just read a line from it. He says, uh, "Ecology is the study of home, while economics is its management." Ecologists try to define the conditions and principles that enable a species to survive and flourish. Yet in elevating the economy above those principles, we seem to think we are immune to the laws of nature. And that statement really challenged the way that I understood and was being taught about the economy because the ecology just never really came up. 
So I was wondering if you could speak uh, to your kind of conception of what is an economy and, and how does it affect uh, our relationship to the natural world and how does it value the natural world? Yeah, I mean, that's a great uh, question to get back to basics. Um, I think, I mean, to me, the economy is the sum total of all of the work that we do. I mean, starting with, you know, making dinner and taking care of the kids uh, to things like volunteering and arts and culture, all of these in addition to the provision of, of goods and services that we do for each other uh, for money in, in the marketplace. Um, and what I learned in my ecological economics um, almost 30 years ago now, uh, is that economy and ecology have the same uh, Greek root, uh, oikonomia, uh, which basically means management of the household for the benefit of all members. Um, and one of the ecological economists I studied back then, Herman Daly, uh, he says that much of economics has shifted away from becoming oikonomia to what he calls crematistics, the maximization of short-term profit. And sure enough, to David Suzuki's point, and I'm a huge David Suzuki fan, you know, going way back, um, we have to understand the human economy as a subset of the biosphere. Uh, so the wastes that we produce from our economic activities, whether that's air or water pollution, carbon emissions, uh, and more the more of the depletion of natural resources, um, together threaten human civilization uh, as we know it, and possibly much more uh, apocalyptic outcomes. So uh, we need to you know, rethink our, our, our sense of, of what the economy is and who it's for, and then how that is embedded and, and ideally is somewhere in harmony uh, with the rest of the natural world. And um, also kind of a back, back to basics question, the way that we talk about the economy, at least in, in the kind of mainstream dialogue and politics, uh, that the idea of growth is kind of completely tied up in, in how we see the economy. So I wanted to ask you your, your thoughts on growth being kind of the main purpose of the economy. And, um, and if not growth, kind of what do you see the, it, the, the purpose of the economy? Yeah, I mean, I think in a, a capitalist economy, growth, you know, is, is paramount. Uh, and in addition, you know, that's kind of how we roll. The human population uh, continues uh, to grow. I think, you know, the, the number of humans on the planet has basically doubled uh, since the time that I was born. Uh, and the income per person uh, has, uh, has also continued to grow. Um, that said, I think there's a lot, and this is where the climate justice piece comes in, there's uh, huge discrepancies, huge inequalities in who benefits uh, from that growth and who benefits from using fossil fuels. Um, so ultimately, you know, this is really about the, the growth and the amount of resources that are consumed by the top tier of humanity, you know, the top, you know, 10 to 15 uh, percent, uh, and the amount of wastes uh, and resource depletion uh, that we, you know, collectively uh, impose on the planet, often for, you know, very frivolous things. Uh, meanwhile, you know, huge portions of human civilization are, are very poor and don't necessarily benefit from, from that economic growth. So I think, in, you know, coming back to the idea of what, it was in, what is an economy for, um, we, you know, we need to use our collective wealth and intelligence uh, to build an economy that ensures we meet uh, everyone's basic needs. Um, there's a a concept coming out of the United Kingdom called the foundational economy, which is that, you know, there are different layers of, of the economy and there are certain core ones that are essential to the you know, flourishing of, of humans in terms of like basic goods and services uh, that we need. Uh, I also think that's a little bit of the appeal of things like universal, you know, basic income that, you know, we should be, we have enough wealth to provide the, the basics for, for everyone, you know, without question. At the same time, I also like the idea of having a, a dynamic economy that provides us the luxuries um, and the, you know, the, the technological gadgets and, and interesting and innovative things, but they have to fit within fairly strict ecological limits, you know, far more strict than, you know, we're currently getting away with today. So, you know, it's a world, I think, that's like more high quality public services uh, and fewer private personal goodies and especially, you know, gratuitous things like, you know, private jets and, and yachts. 
Um, so we should be trying to like, you know, squ squeeze things so we have, you know, zero poverty and homelessness on the one hand and zero extreme wealth uh, on the other. I don't think there's really anything holding us back from doing those things except sort of phantom fears uh, of debt. You know, this idea that, you know, somewhere down the road, some future group of humans in our perception may owe too much money or have lent too much money to another large group uh, you know, of humans. Um, I think it's the wrong way of thinking about it. It's ultimately about how we mobilize resources uh, in, the, in the here and now and you know, provide a high level of well-being for everyone. And so do you think we need to move away from indicators such as GDP and move towards, I mean, there, there's so many out there, but like the human well-being index or just another way for us to conceptualize how the economy is doing year to year? Maybe. Um, I, you know, I do think with GDP for all of its flaws, and you know, it's, it's certainly not uh, a great indicator of our overall standard of living. And that is true of you know, adjusting for inflation or, or you know, GDP per capita. Um, there are many uh, flaws with, with GDP. Um, but attempts to kind of consolidate other factors into uh, another single index uh, of, of measurement are also very challenging. Mm. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been through like all of them and it, it's, a, it's a fascinating discourse because it, it, uh, you have to ask, okay, well, what, what actually matters? You know, what are we including uh, in, in our index and how are we weighting those, those different things? And then how does that drive your, your answer? Um, so I think ultimately, you know, whether that indicator is going up or going down, you're going to want to go through the components to figure out what's driving the particular change. So my own feeling is that we need more of a dashboard uh, approach um, that, you know, we need to be looking at, you know, economic growth is useful for some things, but we need to be looking at employment and poverty and homelessness and, you know, the amount of people who are adequately housed, like all of these things you know, should be part of, of a dashboard approach to, to measuring the economy. So I think in some ways, economic growth is a bit of a fetish in a policy uh, circles, but I think the idea of, of, of degrowth or zero growth can be similarly uh, trapping. Um, you know, ultimately, it is, you know, our, if we're providing the, the basic goods and services that people need and we're creating a dynamic and interesting economy, you know, it shouldn't really matter whether the GDP is going uh, up or up or down. But at the same time, like we should acknowledge that you know the growth in GDP has come you know hand in hand, you know moved in lockstep with the the, the degradation we've seen uh, of the environment and, and and carbon emissions. So you know the extent to which we can really decouple the two is essentially the challenge of our times. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about debt just for a minute. Um, you know politicians seem to tend to be fiscal, fiscally conservative when they're the opposition and less so when they're in power. Uh, but it is obviously an argument that we hear a lot. Um, before the pandemic, you know, there wasn't enough money for, for meaningful widespread climate action. Once the pandemic hit, we saw that politicians could actually access and, and marshal billions, if not trillions of dollars quite quickly. Um, can you explain your what just expand a bit on what you were talking about in terms of debt? Uh, because when we're talking about the recovery and climate action, we are talking obviously of spending a lot of money. That money will will pay its dividends. But but how do you view debt, and how worried should we be about debt? Um, yeah, I'm I'm not particularly worried about um, about debt right now. Like at the end of the day, like. You know, there's two parties to any transaction on debt. You know, there's the borrower and, and, and the lender. So, like I was saying, like a, a lot of this is this this fear that um, you know governments may at some point owe too much to to other uh, parties. Um, but you know, there's always two sides to that transaction. And so, what what really matters right now is like, well, what's the cost of of servicing uh, that debt? You know, how and interest rates are in, incredibly low. And, and essentially, like the, the flip side of that transaction is that you know government debt uh, offers up safe assets for people to invest their money into, right? So if you if you have money, you need to do something with it. You can put it in stocks, you can put it in real estate, you can buy bonds. Those are really your your main uh, set of options. So you know part of the issuing of government debt is also sort of in service to uh, financial markets. Um, but I think this idea that, you know, you raise around, around how COVID has been such uh, a game changer and things that were previously, uh, you know, considered impossible uh, have 
essentially become possible once uh, necessity made it so and once there's been a, a will to actually go there. So I think that's the kind of mindset that we need to shift when we start, start thinking about, uh, about climate. The other piece I think that's really interesting around debt right now is that you know, it's not just the federal government issuing debt, but it's also the Bank of Canada that's buying up a lot of debt uh, in, in the marketplace. Um, so in doing so, they are, um, you know, giving money to people who are currently holding, um, you know, financial assets in the form uh, of bonds. Um, but the, the trick in all of that is that, um, well, then who then does the federal government owe the money to? Well, the Bank of Canada. Okay, so they're paying interest to the Bank of Canada. But at the end of the year, if the Bank of Canada has a profit, it reverts back to its owner. Who is that? The federal government. So it's a little bit uh, of a trick, um, uh, but it actually works. Um, and it's, you know, they, they call it quantitative easing. And, uh, you know, there are different ways of, of going about it, but it's kind of a, a new approach to, the, to dealing with monetary policy uh, that essentially says, you know, uh, there are um, some constraints on, on government, but ultimately it's about mobilizing resources into action. And as long as you're, you're, you're injecting money into the economy uh, in a way that's not overheating things, but that's backfilling the, the lack of demand because people are, are you know, short of work or, or, or income, then there's no reason to fear that this is gonna have like really massive consequences um, down the road. Uh, and in fact, if anything, you know, maintaining high levels of employment now has a benefit down the road because if people are out of work for a long time, it makes them harder to you know, employ. If we, if we let things really fall apart, then you're looking at people losing their homes, businesses, you know, becoming bankrupt, you know, um, all kinds of like negative consequences that are much harder to break out of what we call a depression. Uh, in, in um, you know, if we look back uh, historically, that's not a place we want to get to. It can be really hard to get out of. Yeah. Uh, there's been a, a lot of work coming out recently by um, senior economists around the world, uh, the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate, I believe it's called, which uh, estimated there is about a $26 trillion opportunity from now, between now and 2030. And uh, a lot of what the economists are saying is that climate action would create greater short-term uh, economic growth, long-term savings and job growth than going back to business as usual. Is that is that in line with kind of your, your thinking as well? Yeah, I mean, the main driver of a capitalist economy is investment, uh, and there tends to be big, you know, swings, you know, up up and down, uh, private investment and, and public uh, investment. But you know, the way to think about some of the change that we need is that you know we need to shift uh, investments that would be going into expanding fossil fuel infrastructure or more you know exploration and drilling shift those investments into the investments that we actually need um, you know rapid transit and new housing uh, renewable energy uh, all of those and then over time you know that dynamic then then takes over uh, and you start to you know shift away from an economy that's based on fossil fuels to one that's based on on, on renewables. The only challenge right now is that you know the urgency around climate uh, it is greater than I think than it has been. The, the sort of more gradual incremental approach that folks like me have been advocating for a couple of decades, um, you know, we're now in a situation where we actually need you know more rapid, more aggressive uh, approaches if we are going to you know contain um, the challenge we have and you know essentially provide uh, a habitable planet for our grandkids. Yeah. Great. Well, that's a great segue into some of the Canadian policy questions. Obviously, the carbon tax is being front and center um, controversial or made controversial uh, by politicians and talked about a lot in the media. I was wondering if you could tell us your thoughts on carbon pricing specifically, but also relative to the other tools at our disposal, such as regulation and subsidies. How important is carbon taxing? I'll note that with the elections, Biden has the most ambitious climate plan of any presidential candidate and carbon uh, pricing is, is not a part of it. Yeah, I mean, so if Biden wins, and maybe as we're talking, he's already won, <laughs> <laughs> um, then essentially you'd have every G7 country with uh, a net zero pledge by 2050. Uh, and that's significant, right? And, and, you know, along with some of the commitments China's making. So I think there's an argument to me that, that we are starting to see uh, some momentum building uh, into the right direction. 
then the question is, okay, well, you've agreed to those targets. How do you actually achieve them? So I think the toolbox is basically this. I mean, you have carbon pricing is a, a really important uh, tool. Uh, various regulations or rules that we, we put in the marketplace. There are subsidies, and there's almost the opposite of the carbon tax, another way of trying to create incentives. Uh, and then there are various public investments that, that need to be made. Uh, I think that, you know, in the discourse as climate policies evolve in Canada, almost too much weight has been put on carbon pricing, largely because of economists, you know, like myself, because there's this intuitive idea that if we just get the prices right, if we call it internalize the externalities, or with all these costs that get imposed on third parties now and into the future from our carbon emissions, if you could just, you know, have a carbon tax that reflected those costs, then the marketplace would do its magic and, and we would get an, uh, an allocation of resources that puts us on, you know, this sort of like net zero path. I think, you know, we have to be more cautious on that, um, largely because the of the politics um, that to get a high enough carbon price to drive the deep emission reductions we need is very politically difficult. So, you know, here in Canada, we've just gone through this exercise of the past few years where you know, in 2022, we will have a national floor carbon price that's basically equivalent to like 11 cents per liter of, uh, on, a, on a, you know, filling up your tank of gas uh, at the pump. So it's not a really huge uh, change in terms of, of how it's shifting uh, incentives. So, so we, we've had some modest carbon pricing, but to get to uh, levels that economists say, you know, if you were to continue those annual increases, um, then we might eventually get to that place. But I think politicians are wary of going beyond, you know, the $50 per ton uh, maximum uh, now. Now we're expecting a new federal climate plan in the weeks to come. So there may be a new pathway that builds on that, on that carbon pricing experience. So to me, I think carbon taxes are, are good in the sense that they do create some incentive to change uh, behavior, but more importantly, they raise revenue. And that revenue can be used to fund the things that we want to, to put into sort of various um, activities that reinforce uh, climate action. So I think that's kind of the, the more nuanced view I take on, on carbon pricing. I think we also need, in addition to incentives, we need some very clear rules and, and, and bans on certain activities. So rather than trying to like do this all through pricing, I think we need to say, you, you know, after 2030, you can't buy a vehicle with an internal combustion engine. Uh, after 2030, you can't buy a brand new house uh, that has uh, natural gas uh, as its main uh, heating and, and, and water, you know, water heating source. Uh, and a, a phase out of uh, the use of gas and other fossil fuels in existing buildings, uh, moratorium on new fracking sites or oil sands mines and, and sort of stopping investments in new fossil fuel infrastructure that, you know, is inconsistent with where we need to go. Um, the other piece is we need a big public investments. Uh, let's build out rapid transit in cities across Canada and connect those cities with a high speed rail. That's maybe a little trickier, the high speed rail part in BC, but certainly in Southern Ontario and Quebec, uh, it's something that people have talked about, you know, for decades. So let's just do it. Let's, let's, let's build it. Uh, and let's build a generation of, of public led uh, affordable housing, um, you know, mid rise wood frame passive house, you know, built to the highest standards with very low embodied uh, carbon emissions in, in the construction. So I think there's a lot of things we can do that are, are simultaneously our work program and employment program, but also industrial strategy and climate policy at the same time. Um. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything you've said in terms of the, the vision you've laid forward. And there's, there's you know, the Green New Deal, there's um, Project Drawdown, there's, you know, this, this growing body of work that does a really great job of showing us the path forward. Uh, and, and the models are getting more and more precise in terms of their cost and benefits. Um, so something we say a lot of climate ventures is we have all the solutions we need. We probably need carbon capture uh, in the future, but generally speaking, we have pretty much all the solutions already available. The implementation piece is lacking. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. I mean, we, we know how to get there and it's, it's you know, cultural or, or political 
will that, that is sometimes lacking? How do we bridge that? Um, well, I mean, I think things like the idea of a Green New Deal are, are really important that people can, can get behind. I um, mean, we were kind of championing a Green New Deal during the last major crisis, like, you know, 2008 to 2010. Uh, but I still think that's the right way to go, that it's, you know, it's a big jobs program uh, that builds the infrastructure that we need with labor that's you know, currently idle. So I think it's a very good fit as we emerge uh, out of the pandemic over the next few years, but it's also something that people can rally around. Um, my former colleague at CCPA, Seth Klein, uh, just wrote this uh, fantastic book called A, a Good War. Uh, actually, here, I'm, I'll show it to people here. It's a nice uh, plug. Yeah, learn, you know, basically learning the lessons of World War II to mobilize uh, for the, the climate emergency. And he kind of finished his final draft like the week before COVID hit, so he didn't have to add wow. some chapters on, on COVID at the end. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, you know, it's changing the conversation uh, to a wartime mentality and, and putting things on the table that are currently not there, like how, how you manage uh, a wind down of the of fossil fuel production uh, in Canada. So a lot of our current thinking about uh, climate policy in Canada is around uh, reducing consumption. Obviously, that's important you know, in, the, in the form of our transportation system and our buildings uh, and our, our industry. Uh, but I think simultaneous to that, we need to be talking about, you know, how we shrink, um, you know, fracking and liquefied natural gas and you know, oil sands and you know, other fossil fuel production. We've already started to do this with coal, but you know, for oil and gas in particular, how do we shrink those down to essentially zero uh, by 2050, and do so in a way that's you know doesn't throw workers under the bus, you know, that works with communities to to think about transition plans, uh, to do it you know in a way that's fundamentally like holistic and fair, um, but you know that's that's actually you know living within the reality of that type of a of a carbon budget. So you know I think. We're at a stage now where COVID has um, expanded the realm of the possible. You know, we, we changed our unemployment insurance system. We provided these massive wage subsidies to keep employees on the payroll. We housed homeless people in vacant hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of these things, I think, invite us to reimagine alternative futures that have you know, vastly different rules and social norms and based on principles like public health and collective well-being. So I think, I think that's, a, that's a good start. Beautifully put. Um, my questions are going to move us a bit away from Canada. So Zoya is wondering, I've, I've seen some activity I haven't monitored, monitored closely, but I'll ask one more question. And if uh, in the meantime, you can maybe pick out two or three questions that are specific to Canadian policy, and then, uh, and then I'll move us a bit away from that. And then we can open Q&A again at the end. Uh, sure. But my next question, uh, Mark, was about the way that we talk about our targets in Canada and, um, and drawing down our emissions, where do the emissions that come from exporting fossil fuels that come out of the ground in Canada get burned somewhere else? Uh, how do those get factors, factored in or do they at all? Yeah, I think this is you know, building a little bit on, on the, the previous uh, question, which is to say that you know, the convention for uh, tallying up emissions is based on you know, essentially what you burn within your borders. Um, you know, within the borders of Canada, uh, within the borders of British Columbia. Um, but uh, we also are major exporters of uh, fossil fuels. So it is true that we import, um, you know, oil from you know, Saudi Arabia and the Middle East that generally goes to the eastern part of Canada, but we're massive exporters of uh, fossil fuels on the other side, uh, you know, largely from, uh, from Western Canada. So if you take a different way of, of measuring it, you know, there's different ways. It doesn't have to just be in territorial emissions, like what's what's in there. You could look at it, um, you know, what people call a carbon footprint. So, like, what is the consum the consumption that Canadians um, uh, use in terms of goods and, and services? Um, what are the emissions associated with that? You know, that and that would count, uh, for example, emissions in China for manufacturing. Right. You know, goods that we then consume later in here and would net out any exports we have. The way, the other third way that I, I think is the, a good way to think about it for us is how much carbon is coming out of the ground. Uh, you know, how much uh, oil and gas and coal, uh, you know, comes out of the ground and that eventually makes it uh, into the atmosphere. 
So if you start with those territorial emissions and then you add essentially net exports of fossil fuels and convert those into emissions. Um, and that's basically a measure of the amount of fossil fuels coming out of the ground. When you do that, you find that the amount of emissions attributed to Canada is basically double what our official emissions uh, inventory is. And I think that's why we need to uh, you think thing, things differently in terms of, of things like a managed wind down of fossil fuel production. Because right now, so much of policy is focused on, okay, well, we'll reduce uh, emissions domestically and doing kind of a, you know, half-assed job at that. But then at the same time, you know, the federal government is, is uh, you know, bought a, a pipeline to help expand a production from the oil sands in Alberta. Uh, the British Columbia government, which has this, you know, great clean BC plan, simultaneously trying to like double production from fracking in order to feed a liquefied natural gas uh, export industry. And they can do that because the ultimate emissions are counted in somebody else's inventory. They're counted, you know, where they're burned in Korea or China or, or, or Japan. Um, and so we need to start thinking about um, frameworks that are slightly different. The Paris Agreement is a, is a great uh, start and it's dealing with sort of domestic consumption, but we kind of need an analog to the Paris Agreement for production. Um, you know, and it would be basically based on the idea of a carbon budget. You know, there's a certain amount of carbon we can extract this year and then next year, and then eventually it's driving down to zero. Uh, we need to allocate that in a way that's fundamentally fair based on, you know, uh, what countries are doing and what historical, you know, injustices that, that, they, that, that they may have had. Um, one uh, interesting approach that um, my, my friend Sephora Berman has championed is the idea of a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. So, you know, it's also kind of using that kind of war mm -hmm. metaphor nuclear disarmament applied to fossil fuels and in using that as a framework or a tool for for mobilizing so that you know people can sign on to it cities could sign on to it um, uh, nations like you know india could sign on to it uh, and so eventually you know building essentially from the ground up the type of agreement we eventually need to see and enshrine globally awesome thank you so do we have a couple related questions yeah, um, we, you're looking for a Canadian specific one. So there's a question from Todd around, do you think that the Trudeau government is really committed to a green economy? Oh, I don't know, actually. <laughs> I mean, I've been very critical of the Trudeau government for speaking out of you know, both sides uh, of, of its mouth. To the extent the government can have a mouth, um, you know, by talking a, a good game around, you know, uh, climate action and and setting new targets. So, you know, the federal government is now going to bring in a new target of net zero by 2050. You know, that's great. It's going to bring forward a new climate plan. But so far, what we've seen to date has not been sufficient to meet even our existing weaker targets uh, for, for 2030, uh, which date back to, to the Harper uh, government. Uh, and simultaneously, the Trudeau government has been you know, promoting expansion of fossil fuel production and export uh, on the other. So you can't have it both ways. And so at some point, there needs to be some kind of, of, of reckoning on that. So I feel like the, the Trudeau government has basically is trying to appease um, uh, you know, two different you know, blocks of, of voters, but in a way that that's fundamentally uh, incompatible. So hopefully we'll see some, some movement uh, on that. I feel like there are a number of folks you know, in, uh, in, in government and uh, in, in the Liberal Party who are supportive of, of stronger action, but we haven't really seen it to date. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were a couple of questions about, um, so you talked a bit about uh, GDP, uh, so there are a couple of questions around um, if you can name some good examples of maybe societies that are getting it right or that have ways to quantify its waste and inefficiencies, uh, or perhaps are there models and indicators that you would point to? Um, there was some conversation in the in the Q and A about um, well being budgets. Uh, Brian, have you talked about the the, the human well being um, uh, index or other uh, other forms of um, indicators and measures? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a number um, like the Herman Daly, um, you know, published something called the you know Index of Sustainable Economic Welfare. So he I mean, he tried to like. You know, start with GDP and then you know add certain 
things that, that matter to us, like, you know, household labor and subtract other things like the costs of you know, environmental uh, depletion. Uh, there have been various efforts uh, like that, you know, over the years. Um, the, the Center for the Study of Living Standards in Ottawa has done uh, a measure, and I'm forgetting the exact name of it right now, but uh, what was interesting about it was they, they broke the economy into, you know, four different, um, you know, categories. So there was like, you know, straight up economy, and then there was inequality and some other like social things. Um, and then it kind of created this framework where you, the user could, you know, look at the data and you could say, well, you know, I don't really care about inequality. So I'll weight that as zero. And then it kind of produces a different thing, or, you know, I want to weight that higher than something else. So you're, I think you're always into these, um, these judgment calls around trying to come up with an alternative indicator. So I, I, you know, again, I think that kind of a more of a, of a dashboard approach, like thinking clearly about what it is that's really important uh, to us and then, you know, measuring that well and then developing plans to, to you know, uh, achieve various targets related to those. Mm -hmm. um, building on that one more question. Uh, so there's a question that said, uh, as ecological economics continues to grow as an independent field of study, how can scholars and researchers become more, uh, more adopted in policy and business practice? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I do feel like consciousness around this has you know, improved dramatically, you know, since I first studied ecological econo economics almost, you know, 30 uh, years ago. Um, you know, so it is becoming, uh, you know, more uh, mainstream. So, I, you know, just sort of like continuing that that pathway forward um, and, you know, and also not just focusing too narrowly on carbon emissions, you know, which are obviously, you know, an existential threat uh, to human civilization, but there's a whole other, um, you know, all kinds of other uh, environmental uh, issues in terms of how the human economy uh, engages with uh, the biosphere that we should be uh, keeping track of uh, as well. And in some cases, in things like um, you know, the damages from from air pollution associated with burning fossil fuels, like um, you can justify, uh, you know, uh, eliminating fossil fuels just on the basis of air pollution alone without even necessarily getting into uh, the carbon emissions. But, you know, keeping keeping all of those things, uh, you know, front uh, and center. And, you know, I think like Barnaby said earlier, it's not really a question about, you know, whether we have the technology uh, to do this, it's really more about uh, the political will and just you know rallying uh, people together, you know, getting the 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 march going so that politicians can be you know can jump to the front of the line and, and lead it. You know, that's the old saying that you know if the people lead, politicians will follow. Okay. Thank um, you. Okay. Did, uh, do you have time for one more, or do you want to? Continue? Sure. Maybe we'll circle back. I'll ask a couple more questions, and then we'll and then I'll open it to, to the. The audience. Sure. Um, I feel it'd be hard to have a conversation and not uh, at least allude to the elections happening. And uh, I won't go check the results. But if Trump has lost, please put it in the chat. If he has won, please do not put it in the chat. I won't be able to focus. But my question is, uh, you know, I, I, obviously this is a very consequential election for the climate, and you referred a bit to like a, a global. Um, carbon budget, and I'm wondering, we've talked a lot about national policies, wondering for you, and I know this is, this could be a book, so <laughs> I feel bad asking, asking this question, but what does this kind of look like at a global level? Like through what institutions could we get to this level of, of um, united kind of policy or shared policy visions so that we can achieve this? Because uh, as we know, if one country does great and others do terrible, we don't get much further. Yeah, and I just I want to say it just I, I put some links to resources, um, uh, some of my work and the Climate Justice Project in the chat if folks want to go. Uh, Thank you. Uh, go go further uh, in all of this. Um, yeah, I mean that that international cooperation piece is is uh, is really difficult. I mean at, at every level, um, climate change is a is a collective action problem. You know, whether it's at the level of a city or a province or a nation, you know, or, or the world. So, you know, we need to build better institutions that allow us to deal with the gravity of the problem and not get captured by uh, very powerful uh, vested interests, you know, from, from the fossil fuel sectors. 
you know, I think, you know, we've seen progress on that in terms of the Paris Agreement. Uh, I talked about sort of an analog of that that could be around the production side and, uh, you know, a more supply side approach to, to managing that. Um, ultimately, we probably need something more that has uh, some teeth to it in terms of, of, uh, of you know, how you uh, uh, are able to, you know, compel uh, impact. So maybe we want to look at things like the World Trade Organization, uh, you know, which is a, a, an institutionalized forum that, you know, governs all of these complicated uh, uh, areas. Um, but, you know, if countries are taking policies that, you know, are contrary to the, the intent and purposes of that agreement, then they can face, uh, you know, financial consequences uh, for that as well. So it's a tall order. It would require getting, you know, China and the United States and Brazil and India and Europe all uh, on board. Um, you know, Canada is likely to have not a you know, huge uh, influence at that table, although maybe as kind of a, a kind of secondary power, you know, Canada has some convening capacity that um, uh, could be brought to bear to uh, to help us that way. But but certainly like um, you know, innovation around uh, global institutions uh, is an area that's going to need to be uh, going to need to happen over the next couple of day, decades for us to get to where we need to be. Great, thanks. I'll ask uh, one last question, and uh, if you can answer quickly, I'll just try to make time for um, for the audience to ask questions. Uh, so my question simply is, you know, for many people, maybe the majority of Canadians, uh, the way we influence policy most is when we vote. And I was wondering, outside of that one single act, how do you? Uh, what are some of the best ways for Canadians to be involved in policy work and to actually influence policy? Um, you know, I think there's, there's, um, you know, like I was saying, if the people lead, then politicians will follow. And I think, you know, engaging on policy, you know, is one thing, and it's, it's great to be uh, literate on this. Um, you know, ultimately, it, once you start going into the policy realm, things get pretty complicated, and um, uh, and it's challenging to <clears throat> have a sustained engagement on those issues. And it's so easy for for politicians to kind of bullshit their way uh, through this uh, around policy. So certainly at that level of engagement is important, uh, connecting with your you know, elected representatives in between elections, you know, writing those letters, but there's a certain element of like bodies in the street, I think that, that needs to happen. And so I was really inspired I feel like, to be honest, I go to some pretty dark places <laughs> on this stuff. Um, but, um, you know, with, with Greta and the youth movement around climate action that we saw last year, that um, that element of getting bodies in the street so that um, politicians pay attention. And not just, you know, uh, once a year on a nice day on the weekend, but, you know, more regularly. I was actually very inspired by the uh, pre-COVID uh, Indigenous protests uh, across uh, Canada, which were, you know, linked to a pipeline connecting the fracking fields in the northeast of BC to LNG in the northwest of, of BC, uh, that became, um, you know, a spark for, uh, you know, protests that were actually, uh, you know, shutting down ports and, you know, stopping traffic and, and inconveniencing people. And, you know, I'm not necessarily the one to be <laughs> saying that um, protests should inconvenience uh, people, but, uh, I think, you know, we do need bodies in the street and we, in, in order to keep politicians focused. And if there's a movement there and there's, you know, strong demand for change, then politicians will move to get out in front of it. But I don't think we're putting nearly enough pressure on them. Great. Thank you. Um, just curious, would you be able to stay an extra five minutes? Sure. Be a yeah. yeah. Awesome. Great. Uh, so, yeah, I see there's great little convo already started around uh, investor state dispute courts. I've seen quite a lot of questions. Uh, what do you have for us? I was actually uh, going to follow up on that, um, on what you just said, Mark. Uh, there's a question in the Q&A of, for those who do want to learn more, do you have any recommendations for foundational texts that, that introduce the concept of environmental economics or economic theory that considers the environment? And this came from someone who runs a program for youth ages 16 to 24 who are curious about this but aren't sure where to start with their learning. Um, in terms of texts, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the what the current state of the art would be. I mean, there's an economist in the States named Frank Ackerman who wrote, like, it's a paper, but it's really more of a book called, you know, Climate Economics, you know, State uh, of the Art. 
Um, Herman Daly, it's something I've referred to a couple times now. Um, you know, he wrote this book like a long time ago called For the Common Good, which I think is a really great, you know, critique of conventional economics and, uh, you know, one of the seminal texts of, uh, of ecological economics. Uh, our Climate Justice Project actually produced a bunch of curriculum materials. Um, it was Lessons for Transformation or something like that. If you go to the, the link I put in there for the Climate Justice Project, uh, it, I think it's on the, the main uh, page. And so we actually created, uh, you know, they're a little bit dated now, but you could, you could update them fairly easily, uh, modules on different aspects of, of transformation, whether that's uh, food or transportation, you know, or buildings, and encouraging people to think in, in terms of systems change and win-win and policies rather than sort of, you know, green consumerism and, and individual behavior change. I mean, those are important, but I think it's these big systemic solutions and win-wins that we're uh, we're looking for. So I think that's that's where I would start. On that climate justice page, there's also like like enough reports to to help you fall asleep on a on a really bad night. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, yeah, we can follow up with those resources that you put in the chat. And there's also some great book recommendations happening in the chat too. So we'll compile that and send it out. Yeah, I'm gonna have to save a copy of the chat for my own uh, reading. Perfect. <laughs> um, Brian, of you, were there any questions that you wanted to touch on before we wrap up? Oh, uh, you're muted. You're, you're muted. <laughs> This has to happen once in every. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a Zoom call. Oh, it. <laughs> Almost made it. Um, I haven't really been monitoring the questions. So if you and Shay have spotted any or if they've been upvoted, I'm sure we could get one or two more in. Uh, yeah, there was one from Wayne, uh, and it was in the context of a, a just transition to a net zero economy, um, keeping labor in mind. So he asked or mentioned, there's an idea from the Pembina Institute that we may just need to pay possible uh, fossil fuel workers uh, directly because there may not be sufficient green jobs in time. What do you think about this idea? Or can you speak generally to workers and the labor side of the uh, just transition? Yeah, I think, you know, that is like really central to the, the energy transition we need is how we deal effectively with workers, um, you know, directly and, and indirectly employed. Uh, in, in those industries. I think that conversation has become a fairly mainstream. It was kind of an originally an idea coming out of the labor movement, but uh, in places like Spain, uh, they've had this amazing just transition uh, package for workers in the coal industry that uh, includes uh, you know, various income support and bridging to retirement and uh, you know, pensions and uh, you know, a whole bunch of, of other stuff. Uh, even in Alberta, uh, the phase out of coal for um, for electric power, uh, you know, tells us that, you know, you know, we can, we can do these things. Um, I think they include a number of sort of key elements, you know, so, you know, uh, income support, you know, bridging to retirement. I think even, you know, just having a plan that, uh, you know, evolves over a few decades, uh, there's a lot of attrition that happens uh, every year and that can do like the most of the heavy lifting in terms of, of the transition. And then for those who aren't able to, to go that route, then we need sort of advanced you know, education and, and training programs. And then finally, there's a piece that often gets left out of the conversation on just transition, and that's like supports uh, at the community level uh, to you know, promote you know, new forms of, of economic development that allow people to stay uh, in their communities. Because um, I think that can be a, a really difficult piece. Um, you know, what we've seen from unjust transitions, which are largely led by you know, changes in commodity prices or industry downsizing, uh, is that it can be devastating, uh, not just on the workers themselves, but on, on their communities and their families and, you know, little leagues and, you know, volunteer firefighting and the whole range of things. So I think if we put um, some thought in this and we, you know, we guarantee that no one's going to get thrown under the bus in this transition, uh, then there's a lot of uh, prospect um, for, um, for having good just transition policies. Thanks, Mark. And as Shay uh, just mentioned in the chat, uh, next month we have Bruce Wilson of Iron and Earth, uh, and I'm sure we'll get into a just transition there for workers. Um, great. Well, I think we're pretty much almost out of time. And with uh, this question, and just asking you, 
Uh, well, specifically now, regardless of which way this election uh, to the south of us goes, what's giving you hope these days? Uh, you said, mentioned, you shared that you've been to some dark places. I think anybody who follows the climate uh, is familiar with those dark places, but, but we keep doing this work. So I'm wondering what gets you out of bed. Um, well, like I said, I mean, I think the response around COVID and, you know, how everyone got on board, you know, a program that was, you know, very radical um, and did so very quickly, I, you know, I think that's inspiring. It, it tells us that, you know, we're not locked into certain ways uh, of being. And then, you know, the youth activism, I, I think, is always um, something that that is is worth um, supporting. So, you know, when your teenager tells you you need to, you know, get on board, then listen to them. Well, thanks again, Mark. And thank you, Zoya and Shay, and to our audience for coming. And uh, we hope to see you next time. Zoya, was there any closing facts or figures we wanted to share? <laughs> uh, just a note that we will follow up uh, through an Eventbrite email to share some of the resources that Mark talked about. We'll also share a recording of this conversation so you can share it with others. And yeah, and definitely join us uh, for our next CV Conversations on December 3rd. All right. Thanks again for having me on board and it's been great to chat with you. Yeah, thank Same. you. Mark. Thanks, Bye, Mark. Take care. Bye.